Not all cameramen know how all cameras work, so oh, okay. where's the start button? Is how do you turn this thing on? I could have profes- more professionally asked that. So, um, Philip, here we are in your home in Columbus, and Jane Goldberg is working on a book about radiation hormesis and was mm-hmm. really excited when she found out that you had a lot to say about this, and in particular, why it works. I just got a question. So I'm here with Dr. Philip Lippitz, and he's going to be telling us about radiation hormesis and uh, what he told uh, Dr. Jane Goldberg in her book, uh, studying why it works. So why does radiation hormesis work? Well, there's certainly a lot of suggestive evidence that something is going on. So the real question is, what is going on? Why is it that people who have low levels of radiation seem to have unexpectedly high survival rates and low levels of cancer. The research that I did years ago had to do with how this huge length of DNA that you have, which is many feet long, is packed into a small, small cell, so small you need a microscope to see it. So uh, we all know that the uh, DNA is a helix, but then it's coiled into a supercoil, and then that's all coiled around proteins and put together so that it'll fit inside a cell. When a piece of DNA is going to be expressed so that it controls what it is you do in your body, that little bit of DNA escapes from the protein that's binding it and coiling it up and it becomes free. So gene expression is involved in the packaging of the DNA. In the same way, if the DNA is damaged by radiation, it needs to escape from the packaging in order for it to be repaired. One possible explanation of radiation hormesis is that normal background levels of radiation and even the heat of your body cause DNA damage which can lead to cancer. And it, if it occurs, if these bad set, uh, bits of DNA damage occur in a section of the DNA that's packaged inside the protein so that it's hard for the repair enzymes to get to it, it just sits there until it can produce a mutation that can lead to cancer or some other program, a problem. If, however, you have just a small level of radiation, not enough to really damage the DNA, but enough to set off the DNA repair mechanisms, then what it does is it starts the automatic sequence of events that releases the DNA from its protein cage, examines it, repairs it, and then puts it back in the the protein cage. If you start this with just enough radiation to get this going, potentially, and this is unproven, but potentially what could be happening is that you are repairing not only the small amount of damage caused by the background radiation, but you're also repairing the amount of damage that's caused by normal wear and tear, heat of the body, background radiation from some other source, uh, uh, free uh, radicals that you from the food you ate, any of these things. And so it will repair damage that is ordinarily unrepaired. Now this is a hypothesis, but there is some small evidence on that. We did some research years ago on 240 human beings and we exposed their white blood cells to low levels of radiation. And what we found was that people who had been, about 85% of the people who had been exposed to low levels of radiation, their white blood cells, after it was repaired, the DNA packaging, the shape of the DNA was actually in slightly better shape than it was before the radiation. So we know that there is a mechanism that takes low levels of radiation and 
repairs it and restores it to a better state than it had been in before. So potentially, this is what radiation hormesis does. It allows you to repair small amounts of DNA damage that's ordinarily hidden by the protein scaffolding that controls the DNA shape and packaging within the cell. We have to do more research to prove all this, but it's a very plausible hypothesis. You had said that as you age, the coiling is looser, but a person with cancer has tight coils. Can you? Is there a contradiction there? You think cancer is oh, a cancer, bad thing? Yeah, what we found was is, is that bad. this coiling in the packaging went much, 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 much stronger when you had cancers. And that when you had uh, aging, it became looser. So you had these two extremes. We found that even in plant models this held true, and that if we took a, a, a DNA that causes cancer in plants and we increased the coiling the packaging made it stronger, made it tighter. We actually increased the number of tumors that were made. And that if we took that packaging and decreased it, that decreased the amount of tumors that were made. How can So well, let me finish. So another possible mechanism that should be explored is whether or not you, when you expose a cell to low levels of radiation, you are reversing the tendency towards super tight packaging because you're taking it apart, you're examining it, and then you're putting it back together and maybe you put it back together in a state that more resembles normal than the tight packaging that you have with DNA uh, uh, in a cancer cell. By the way, we also took some human cancer cells Peri uh, root uh, leukemia white blood cells and changed the packaging of the DNA in them and morphologically and histologically they appeared to revert totally back to normal cells. So there seems to be some correlation between the degree of packaging, how tight the DNA supercoiling is in cells and cancer on one hand, aging on the other hand. How do you make the packaging tight or loose in laboratory setting? There are chemicals that actually increase or decrease the packaging of the DNA. And what's interesting is that these chemicals are known to alter your immune response. And we showed that this changes the packaging of the DNA of the immune cells. So we have a mechanism by which cells respond to try to keep you happy and that there is in the body naturally occurring molecules whose job it is is to control how tight the packaging of the DNA is. And these are known to be beneficial uh, 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 compounds. Who is we? Who did you work with? On this study? Well, this, this study. work was done at Ohio State University and under the auspices of uh, general molecular applications or myself. And my collaborator on this work was a man by the name of Ralph Stevens. Did you get your PhD on this? No, I didn't get my PhD on this. I had my PhD long before I did this, long before, <laughs> four what, or five years. <laughs> what was that on? Your... Uh, my uh, PhD was on the mechanism of cancer induction using the uh, uh, cascade of molecular events that occur specifically involving prostaglandins and polyamines. It's, it's, it's an obscure topic. I don't know if it will mean anything to your readers. And so the degree was ultimately given in what field? Oh, I have a degree. I have a PhD in biophysics. Biophysics. And I have a couple of dozen publications and things ranging from you know, uh, analytical biochemistry to half a dozen book titles to whatever. So how did you get interested in radiation hormesis from there? 
Is I got it? interested in radiation hormesis because you guys contacted me and asked me. No, but, no, but to right. do that study. When you did all that research. Well, when I did all the research originally. On low-level radiation, what problem? Oh, why did I do the research on low-level radiation? Because I recognized that radiation changed the packaging of the DNA and that we were exposed to all this all the time. I studied with two guys, Ron Hart and Dick Setlow, who were the pioneers in the field of DNA damage and repair. And so my whole training was what happens when the DNA is exposed to low levels of radiation, whether it's from the sunlight, ultraviolet radiation, ionizing radiation, which is what you're talking about, or even other forms of DNA damage like uh, free radicals or the heat of your body. It causes depurination of the DNA. All of these are forms of damage that happen to the DNA. Ron Hart showed that your ability to repair the DNA was directly correlated to how long you lived. And that there was also some studies that were done that showed that if you don't repair the DNA properly, it can cause cancer. So, of course, we then became interested in the whole question of low levels of radiation because low levels of radiation are everywhere around us. So how does the body respond to that? What do you think about radon in basements? Or did you ever consider that? Never considered that issue. Yeah, because there's some studies that say it's actually a good thing, even though there was an industry preventing it. Yeah, I can't comment on that. I do know that in Europe there are certain spas that are down deep in the mines that are heavy in radiation and people pay to get there. And here, people don't want it. I, you know... I remember one funny story that occurred in the laboratory, that we were doing studies on this one carcinogen, and the technicians in the lab were just terrified. We had a solution of less than one hundredth of a percent, and they were terrified to be working with this carcinogen. And so they were, you know, wearing gloves and doing it in safe boxes and isolation and all that, and they were threatening to quit because it, it was a dangerous carcinogen in their mind. And then we were sitting around at lunch and one of the technicians was sitting there putting cream on her psoriasis, on her skin, and we looked and it was a 1% solution, a hundred times more of the same carcinogen. And it was being prescribed to her. So there is a strange disconnect. Right. What about in India? Do they have such waters that people go to? I have no idea. You don't know? I have okay. no idea. Great. Well, Philip, thank you very much. Thank you.